So welcome to this talk. Uh, so first, yes, I'm Julian Vermeer from Sierra Wireless. I'm a principal engineer uh, working mainly on connecting device to cloud and security associated with uh, device to cloud communications. And also I'm committer on Eclipse Lation, Eclipse California, and Wacom. So here, um, yes, so uh, when I do this kind of presentation about uh, uh, IoT security, I try to, uh, to find um, last week uh, a nice uh, security all in IoT, and today it's very difficult to find one. And I think today's uh, obvious case is uh, Mirai with all the um, botnet and which crash, crashed internet last uh, few, few days ago, which is, was a, a very painful situation for, for us, for our cloud service because it took down a part of our cloud service. Um, so the main, uh, I think the main uh, call for that is people who are shipping products, hardware products, as fast as possible, and, and security is hard, or they think it's hard. And um, what we see today is exploitation of very low hanging, hang, hanging fruit, and uh, all the device with basically no security, with default password, which was, wasn't, changed by the user or this kind of stuff. And what I'm going to try to, to, to explain in this presentation is that it's simple to exploit non-secure system by doing a small demo. And also, why it's not so difficult and it's simple to, to, to have a minimum security, especially when you use Eclipse IoT project, which most of them pro provide some kind of security uh, feature like authentication and encryption. So yeah, first topic is uh, network security. Um, this one is, could be obvious, but um, I had a lot of discussion with some non-technical people or a bit technical people that what is, um, what is a man in the middle attacks? So for a lot of people, man in the middle attacks, it starts to be uh, something complicated because you need to, to cut the cable basically and being in the middle of the cable for, for intercepting uh, and intercepting data, like basically doing that to, to plug your PC in the middle of the, of the network. Um, for cutting, on the left you have the IoT device, on the right you have the router. So this is my demo setup. So this is basically a router routing to the internet. This is my IoT device, which is a Linux board. You can be a Raspberry Pi or whatever. And this is my PC for doing the attack, which is very simple. Um, well, it's just a, a Linux PC, nothing fancy. So yes, so before the attack, all the, all the traffic from the IoT device is going through, through the network and go to the internet. Um, and uh, what I'm going to do here is uh, with my, my PC to try to, 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 uh, to, to say to the device, no, I am the gateway, stop sending everything to the router, send everything to me, and then I route everything as without the device understanding what I'm doing. So, <clears throat> okay, so. Um, works, okay. So here I'm connected to my machine, so if I try to, so yes, so what I'm doing here is uh, sending a, a ping message to lesion.eclipse.org, so I see the public IP of these of this machines, so this is a real IP on the internet. Yeah, so this is the device. Yes, okay. I'm connected on the device. Um, yes, so this is connected on the device, so this is console on the device, and the device try to communicate to, to the internet. So what I'm doing to do now. So I'm running um, a very simple tool which is called Ethercape. So it's very nice. You will see it's very easy to do nasty stuff with that. So basically I activated. Uh, so I want to get the list of device uh, on my network. So this is my PC. 
So this is attacking PC. So I see this device. So up, I want to attack this device, and this is a router. So up, I do that. And what I do is I have peep poisoning. So basically, my attacking PC going to say to the device, I am the router, send me all the packets. So I'll try to be very. So um, if I go back here, from the device, nothing is special happening. Um, so yes, so I have a so I have a lesion clients. So so yes, so uh, so what I'm doing here, I'm running uh, a lightweight M2M client, could be a MQTT client or whatever, and I try to connect to the public sandbox, the public session sandbox. <coughs> So, uh, if I do, so, okay, so some people are using the sandbox, but this is my device, and I can do stuff on the device or not, depending on my Wi Fi connections. Okay. Stop. Okay. Yeah, yeah, I see. Okay, so let's try again. Oh, that's Timo good. I'm not with me. Oh, um, okay, no, no, no security here. Okay, maybe I can try with. Okay. Mm -hmm. That's not. Okay. So ba basically, I'm registering on the div on on the sandbox, but maybe the sandbox is broken. I don't know what is going on. So, what I'm going to do now. Uh, with Eta Cape. Um, so I have a configuration here. So, uh, so Eta Cape is very easy to use. Uh, you have a nice uh, DNS, uh, a DNS module. And what I put in a DNS module is um, so the, the, the default, uh, the default uh, joke is to re redirect Microsoft.com to Linux.org. But what I'm doing here is lesion.eclipse.org to go to my local PC in place of going to the, to the network, to the real one on the internet. So basically, this is, okay, this is next slide. I know this one. So if I show you the slide. So basically, uh, my PC will receive all the traffic from the board, and when I see a DNS uh, request, I will just send a fake answer and to redirect the device where, wherever I want. So what I'm going to do now is to run uh, it's, it's to run a lesion server on my PC. Uh, yes, Timo. <coughs> this one, blah, 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 blah. So I have a local mission. Okay, so this is my local lesion server running on my PC. So what I'm going to do is now to activate the DNS module for redirecting this device to, to my local uh, lesion. I go there, 
so plugins uh, manage plugin so you have a, ni a lot of nice attacks already ready to use in EtherCup. so this is DNF spoofing um, okay so now I go back to my to my console on my device so if I try to do DNS resolution. Now you see it's a different IP address, so it's my local PC. And if I try to connect to my local PC, blah, 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 blah. Oh, it's connected to my local PC when the, when the device believe it's connected to, to the public sandbox. So starting from here, if there is no security, I can start to do nasty stuff like rebooting the device, uh, stuff like that, because Lation, uh, Lightweight M2M is a protocol for device management. Uh, okay, so if I just do something very simple, like um, in place of connecting stupidly without security, um, I put some uh, user password for using DTLS PSK, so encrypting the um, encrypting and authenticating the traffic, doing an um, uncheck for authentication using this pre-shared key. See, if I do that, so here I, I, I'm, I'm using, I'm going to use a, a second name so we can see the difference, PSK. So the device is going to try to connect to my attacking PC, but it's not going to be able to do the um, PSK uncheck. Uh, with uh, TLS, the DTLS protocol. And if I go to my, I see no registration. And if, you, if we wait a minute or two, Lation clients is going to complain that he's not able to do a successful uncheck with, uh, with the server. So it, it's very easy to, when you connect to a network to to mess with the network, to mess with the configuration, to mess with the DNS packet, the IP packet, to, to basically start to, to do nasty stuff. Um, yes, so what we do here is the device tries to connect to, my, to the PC, but the attacker don't know the security key, so it's unable to, to, to do the, the DTLS uncheck. So, um, with, um, with gateways, so we often have this model of you have sensor on the, on the left and you try to connect the gateway, the device to the gateway and then the device connect to the internet. And maybe sometimes you want to do is to just have the security and TLS on this side. And to keep here a lighter security scheme like no security, or maybe rely on the local, uh, local network security like Zigbee or, or Wi-Fi or, or stuff like that. So as you can see, this can be a problem. If, you, if someone from outside managed to attack the gateway, he gets access to all the traffic. Um, okay. And um, if someone managed to attack the local network, is able to access to, to, the, um, to the data. For example, for wireless, industrial wireless uh, networks, sometimes you, you can see people doing some very nasty attacks using uh, focused antenna and try to attack uh, industrial uh, application installation like 20 kilometers away and manage to, to, to start to messing with the network. So, um, so people at the IUTF and um, try now to push a models, uh, what we call, what I call here end-to-end -end security, but or people call uh, security on the edge to get the sensor, to have an IP address on the sensor and the sensor is going to, to use, not a gateway, but something more a router to directly connect to the server and to try to, to Google Slides. So um, to, to connect to, to the cloud service and, okay, 
better like that, and to connect to the cloud service, and to, um, and to do the uncheck between the sensor and the cloud service. So the gateway, if someone attacks the gateway, it's not so dramatic, or all the traffic on the local network is protected by the, by the security uh, protocol. So other benefits to have this concept of IP to the age. Um, so you have only IP network, so it's more simple. You can easily change your topology to use Wi-Fi, to use, um, to use Ethernet, to use whatever you want. It's more flexible and scaling. So if you have gateways with a lot of, lot of sensors, scaling IP, IP routing is something well known, uh, much more than trying to scale, I don't know, Profibus or Modbus. Yes, so if you, if you do your, your model, you... Okay, so I will never use Google Slide again. Um, like this, it's okay, you see it well? Okay, good. So, uh, can you trust your local wireless network or your local network? So like you are using a Wi-Fi password, do you have something for managing the Wi-Fi password? Are you sure it's not going to be, to be disclosed and do you have an easy way to change it? Uh, like, can you trust GPS, uh, GPRS encryption and maybe the, in 10 years do you will be able to, to, to trust this? Uh, 3G, 4G, uh, from security point of view, it's okay, but the protocol, but we know there's a problem with fan to cell I will give you an example. Well, Zigbee, you have a security layer on Zigbee. So at the beginning it was fine, and now it's less and less fine. Um, same for Bluetooth, and also you have some low power wireless network without any security layer, so. So for example, for GPRS now, uh, 10 years of maybe 15 years ago, yeah, 15 years ago, it was quite kind of secure, and now for like 10 years ago, maybe, le maybe less, some people started to create uh, very, um, very nice attacks with, which needs a lot of money, a lot of hardware for running, and now you can see you can create your own fake um, 2G base station using a bigger bone, some SDR board, and for maybe 1,000 euro get, get a fake uh, 2G station, and due to the way the protocol is designed, the device is going to try to, to connect to the first, and the, to the first cell is going to, to, to reach with a higher signal level. So it's very easy to now to, to, to attack this kind of network. For 3G, 4G, uh, it's more difficult, but this is an extract from the guys who did the, um, the cheap hacks uh, last year. And um, what they did for hacking the 3G, 4G communication, basically they bought old fem 2 cell you know, some re repeater for, for, for cellular connectivity, on, e on eBay, and uh, just root the device, and when you are root on the fem 2 cell you got access to the local cellular network, so they were able to, to, to communicate with the core, which is connected to the fem 2 cell so, um, so if you want to do end-to-end -end encryption between the device and, and the cloud, what we need uh, is, um, is to distribute key and distribute secrets, so we need to have a, a key management system. So what does that mean? Um, for example, um, you, 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 you have a, a large fleet of devices, you will need to push pressure key, secret, password, uh, you want it to be uh, unique across devices because if someone gets access to one device, you want to be sure he won't be able to attack other devices. And you want to be able to change those secrets because uh, in five years, maybe uh, you want to change the protocols, the security scheme, or someone left your company with a list of secrets, whatever, I don't know. Uh, and you probably uh, want to change your secret after you put some in the factory because your factory is outside, it's far, it's in China or, where, or wherever, and you don't trust so much this factory. 
So for example, in, <coughs> in lightweight M2M, you have this concept of bootstrap. It's one mechanism for doing key distribution. This one is quite efficient for PSK, not, so, not very good for certificate, but for PSK, it's quite good. Um, so the factory flash credentials, uh, what we call bootstrap credentials, the device when it's connected to the internet, okay, see, it doesn't have a configuration but only the bootstrap configuration. So it contacts the bootstrap server and the bootstrap server uh, provide him a security configuration with new keys, uh, the URL for the server for doing the management, and uh, access control list if you use multiple server. And then the device connect to, to, to the end server. And um, you can trigger a reboot swap of the device if you want to change the key. You can basically ask the device to go back to the bootstrap server and then the bootstrap server can push new secrets or for example, you know, we are not going to use PSK anymore, it's broken, we are going to use certificate and, and, and provision uh, the certificates. Um, yes, so that's why I'm explaining here. Um, another solution for doing key, key management is to use uh, this kind of architecture, what we call a public key infrastructure using certificates. Um, basically, you have a root certificates, intermediate certificates, which deliver uh, certificates to the end entities, probably the devices and, and the server. So in practice, it's that. So you have a, a, a root trust with a public key, which is signing an intermediate, um, an intermediate authority, uh, which also have a public key and which is all signing the end um, identity, the end public key of the end device of server. So if you just know the root trust public key, you are able to know uh, this device was ready, uh, trusted, was ready, uh, generated with a certificate from the certificate authority. So a good, um, a good side effect of that, a good effect of that is that when you use password and pre-shared key, uh, you need to know the password, the device and the server need to share the same password. So basically on the server side, you have a database with all the secret. So from um, IT point of view, security can be a problem. With certificate, you just have the public key of the device and you don't have the private key. So how does that work in place of, um, it's not really working like PSK in what I show you for bootstrap is, um, you have a, a device, it's going to generate its private key and public key, key couple uh, locally. And then with this, it's going to send its public key inside what we call a certificate request, saying I'm device uh, one, two, three, uh, this is my public key, I request uh, a certificate to a certification authority. Um, and then the certificate authority is going to provide him a certificate signed with his own private key, and the device got the certificate for authenticating on the service of any service, and the service does the uncheck, basically, and verifies the device um, identity only using the CA public key, and it don't know, it don't have to know uh, the private key of, the, of this device, or maybe it don't even have to know this device um, exists because it just receives the certificate, this valid certificate for this device. You say, okay, this device is already, really is the device one, two, three, so I'm going to accept this communication without, maybe without any provisioning. So it's, some, it's not something new, it's something, we have a lot of protocol in IT for doing this kind of uh, security scheme and key management, what, called IKEY, Internet Key Exchange, CMP, Certificate Management Protocol, uh, SCAP, uh, so it's funny because people started to invent protocols for doing certificate management, and then every time someone is coming with a new protocol which is simpler, so this is the first level of simplification, so simple certificate enrollment protocol. And then it was so complicated, so some people came with EST, Ornament of Secure Transport, which is even simpler. 
You have also some, some standard for doing uh, secure device and entity management. Uh, but it's not really ready to use for constrained network and devices. This is AV um, protocols using HTTP, maybe HTTPS also. So if you try to using or use it over Bluetooth low energy or this kind of technology, you will have some problems. So um, it's an area of work. Um, I'm, today I'm, I'm working on this topic to try to, to do uh, enrollment uh, more efficient on low power networks. But if you don't use a low power network, if you use a plain internet with TCP, with MQTT, it's not a problem. You can use this kind of protocol for, for managing your, your, your secrets. So firmware download. So, uh, so, um, so we have this, this attack. So basically, um, a man in middle attack, and if you don't secure your firmware downloads, anybody is going to be able to inject a firmware to, to, to your device. Um, so it's very easy to, to, to fix this problem. A lot of devices are not securing a firmware upgrade. Um, for example, this is not Lenovo, but I think Asus. Asus have a service on, on their PC which is just downloading the BIOS update through HTTP automatically, without any signature, without any security. It's, it's, it's a bit sad because it's very easy to, to provide some way to at least a minimum level of security on top of that. So if I go over, okay, so, okay. Mm -hmm. So for example, I have firmware here. Um, so most of the firmware are, this is a real firmware from, um, from a, um, a gateway, I uh, won't give the name. So if you look at the dot bin and you, in, in fact it's a tar archive. Um, so if you just rename it as a tar, you can open it. So if you see, there is an image, a Linux image, a Linux kernel, uh, um, some root file system, so it's very easy to, to inject um, to inject a malware inside this kind of firmware. Most of the time it's a flash image, a tarball, um, a zip, or whatever. Okay, so what I can show you now is I have a file which, is, which could be the, the firmware. Okay, it's dark. So, I just have the f this data in my file. If I want to just put a, a signature with from my private key, um, I can use OpenSSL. You have already everything for doing this kind of stuff. Like uh, I can sign the file. Um, so what I'm doing here is sign this file with this certificate with this private key and this is just configuration for the file format. So it's generating a file. Uh, I read the file. Okay, so I see my content and around that I have the certificate as signature. So it's, it's not really important, the details. Um, so if I, I can verify, I can verify the signature. So it's okay, OpenSSL say it's successful. If I try to modify the file, uh, I try, I don't know, capitalize this letter, and this one, for example. If I try, OpenSSL just give an error. So it's very easy to put a signature around the firmware, is yes, just use OpenSSL or GPG or whatever. Everything is open source. Um, Yeah, so this is an example. This is a PTSC, PTSCS7, which is now a RFC. Uh, it's a format for signing files. You have other standard for that. And it's well supported by OpenSSL. As you see, you just run the command and it does the work. 
you have also a new solution on hardware, like we call Secure Boot. So Secure Boot is the idea of, in place of doing that check, that signature check using software, you ask to the ROM inside the device to do this verification before, before running a firmware to check this firmware have the correct signature. So it's very good because for attacking it, you need to do an hardware attack, uh, a local hardware attack. Um, there is a little drawback, which is uh, it's based on, most of them are based on ECDSA. And for example, if ECDSA in five years is broken due to, I don't know, uh, quantic programming, qu quantic computers, uh, you have no way to upgrade it. But it's a good solution. You can combine it with, with a firmware signature managed by software plus uh, hardware managed uh, firmware securing boots and you, you should be quite safe or not part of a botnet. So as you can see on Eclipse IoT, uh, if you look at Leshan, Wakama, TidyDTLS for, for more co-op and also uh, Scandium for more co-op like to attempt to you already have a uh, feature for starting um, a secure communication in PAO. In PAO, most of PAO clients have uh, support for TLS authentication. Uh, Mosquito also, for example, for MQT for Mosquito, you have um, you have TLS using PSK or using certificate. It's very easy to configure it. Uh, in Ono, uh, it's uh, and you see on all the new IoT projects, it's always a goal to provide some security layer. So, and also you have a lot of implementation like OpenSSL, Embed TLS. If you want to run your own PKI, you have this Cloudflare, Cloudflare SSL for generating your certificate. You can use GNU PG also for signing the file you are sending. Uh, even on U-Boot, which is the most common bootloader you use on a uh, on, on lot of device, on a lot of uh, Linux-based device, you have a, a feature for checking a signature before, uh, before um, running uh, or flashing um, a firmware. So everything is there, I think. Uh, you have all the building blocks for at least have a minimum security uh, layer, like basic authentication and, and encryptions. So, so you can now ship your project with uh, at least a minimum security. Um, so, it's, um, so it's the end of the talk, so you still, um, so you know you can ship the bot this way, not like the first GIF, the first uh, GIF. And um, even if it's too hard, a lot of vendors are providing end-to-end -end security with preloaded uh, pre security in the hardware and, um, and cloud service ready to, to use for providing security, etc. There is a lot of vendor for that. So I think there is no more excuse for shipping a product without any security when you have all the tools already available as open source and as proprietary uh, solutions. Thank you. I don't know, I have time for questions. Sure. sure? Basically, what the bot is doing is just trying to connect to random IP and try to use default credentials. So, basically, like one, two, three, four, five. And if it's an end consumer device, and if the, cons the end consumer wasn't aware there is a password and need to change it. So, even if I would use, for example, something like DTLS to protect my, my device, yeah. if I do not change the if you don't have a key management, or at least a minimum key management, like trying to, to provide a random password on, for each device, maybe what you can do is put a, a default password on your device, and you put a sticker with a default device, and you ship it. That's I just wanted to point out, it's not only technology that you need to incorporate, but it's even more simple. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think the first step is to have the technology. We've seen a lot of projects without any authentication, and then the next level is probably more what you call an end user experience, because sometimes it's okay, you have the security feature, but nobody uses it because it's too complex.
Yes. Yeah. If you get a, a CPU with any kind of connectivity like Wi-Fi, cellular connectivity, uh, Bluetooth, or this kind of stuff, it's probably 32 bits. So it's totally able to run AES, and most of the time you have an, an hardware accelerator for that. So it's less and less a challenge, I think. The so microcontroller like ARM Cortex M. Uh, 3M0 and M4 are quite good at that. Uh, it's more, I think it's more a challenge to distribute the key, to put the key securely in the device, and to don't rely on, on stupid passwords that everybody knows. Yes. However, constrained devices are really often very constrained regarding the capability of running or doing RSA-based encryption. So, uh, yeah, so, yeah, the, so the devices we are, we are using and we are experimenting with, they probably take uh, about 20 to 40 seconds for a TLS handshake based on RSA security. So this basically indicates to us that we should better use TSK-based handshake or maybe no. DSA and the DCC-based. It, I think it's really um, a challenge when you have a re very real-time application. If you have a real-time application, it's difficult. If you are not so real time, mm -hmm. it's, you have time to create the, the secure connection, it's, it's okay. All right, so I think I mean, that was really cool, but also pretty dense. I think you guys are just going to need a break. Uh, we are back at a quarter two, so that's about 20 minutes. Uh, thank you very much, Julian. Thank you.